man, even though 2022 seems like it flew by so fast, God still did some incredible things. Amen. Amen. Right, even Frank was talking about all the things that we did with foster care. We, right, we did the thing in the summertime. We had the Christmas party. We ate, you know, every single one of our students went to camp for free this year because of your giving. God did something incredible in 2022. And how many people know that 2023 is no exception? God is going to continue to do something so good in 2023. And I just want to say that I am blessed. Man, I am so blessed to be your kids pastor. I am so blessed to be your youth pastor. And every time I get up here, I say this to you, but I really want you to know that it is an honor that you trust me to disciple your kids. So thank you for that. Um, I always, whenever I do a message, I always want to report back to what your students are doing and things like that. And for the life of me, I could not even figure out how to incorporate it in this message. So I'm just going to open with it. Why don't you throw that picture up there of Justin? This is Justin Drobot, a very own Justin Drobot at Youth Convention. And he is buying a whole rotisserie chicken. And we were there for two days and all of our meals were covered. Like, we are, we are at Meyer, and he buys this entire rotisserie chicken. And I, Jordan didn't even get eaten. I have no idea what happened. And I just, like, it just sat in his room, and it was so disgusting. Um, but this is Justin. Um, I couldn't think of how we could incorporate this. Maybe it's like God gives you more than you need. That seems a little far out. But this is Justin. Um, if you don't know him, um, he, you know, he's, he's going to be a missionary to China one day. It's something that God has called him to do, and he's going to be incredible. Damage to darkness. Amen. But yeah, that's Justin. Um, but let me say this really quick before we get started, right? I already said that God is mighty and we are blessed and this is 2023 and God is going to do incredible things. But let me say this before we get started. There are some of you who have come to this church for years and years and years and you know where to sit. Right, And you know where to serve, and you know exactly how much coffee to pour in, how much cream and sugar to put in, you know exactly when worship starts. Why? Because this is your home, and you feel comfortable here. Amen. But there are some of you who walked in here, and you're still trying to figure it out. You're still trying to figure things out in your own life, and that's okay. But there are some of you who have never been here, and you feel so uncomfortable. But let me just say this. In the kingdom of God, right, this is your home. And you're always welcome here. Have you ever been invited to somebody's house before? And get ready, I'm about to say a poop joke. But have you ever been invited to somebody's house before and you're so polite and so proper, you take your shoes off at the door, you take your dishes to the sink, and you try not to poop in their bathroom because you're being polite, right? <laughs> right, we've all been there. But let me just say this, like I said, in the kingdom of God, you belong here. You always have a seat here, and you can poop in whatever bathroom you want here at the Shores Church. Take a look at Genesis 131, and this is my favorite verse of the Bible. And you hear me say this verse a lot, but this is one of my favorite ones, and I love it so much. And it says, and God saw all that he made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and then there was morning, the sixth day. And I say this verse to our students a lot, and I know I say it every time I come up here, but let this just be a reminder that within creation, right, the sharks, the penguins, the trees, the Chick-fil-A's, like everything that God has ever made, you are within that creation, and he looks at you and he says you are very good. God sees you, God hears you, and he knows the plans he has for you. Amen. Amen. Come on. Let's get started. Um, turn with me to Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 26, and it says this. And if you don't have your Bible, we'll just throw it up on screen. It says, as we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned to the, and said to the Spirit, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. 
They advocate customs that is not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore off their garments off of them, and they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stops. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Let me pray for us. Jesus, you are so good. Thank you for being with us this morning. Lord, will you clear our minds, our emotions, our hearts. Let us take every burden, every sorrow, everything that's weighing on our shoulders and lay them at your feet. Holy Spirit, we know that you are present and we ask that you take control of the service and heal, restore, deliver, set free, anoint, and call your children back home. The name above all names, we speak it so boldly over every situation, Jesus. We ask all this in your mighty name, and everyone said, Amen, Amen. amen. Anybody, anybody like to sing in the house? Anybody just like to sing? Even if you're not good at it, I love to sing, and I'm terrible at it. Like, even Ash Jordan, we'll be, like, in the office, and randomly, I'll be like, I can show you the world, like Aladdin. <laughs> or, like, that other song, The Little Mermaid, like, where the people are. I don't know why those songs hold such an affinity in my heart, but I just like to sing them. And I know that I'm really bad at it. When I was a little kid in elementary school, we had this pistol whip of a music teacher who wasn't afraid to say what she was thinking. <laughs> and we were getting ready for our Christmas play, right? It was, it was where um, we were all snowed in for Christmas and we got stuck at the school. And I was blown away. I was ecstatic when she told me I got the role of Ralph who was like this computer nerd who wanted to buy all of his parents' Christmas gifts online, and there was also like a singing solo. And I was like, man, I must have got this part because I'm a great singer. But then I started looking around at all my white classmates, and I'm like, okay, this makes sense. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But I was, I was so ecstatic, I was like, man, Ralph the computer nerd! And we're all up on these rides. Has anybody like been in a choir or a music class and there's all these risers? And I was like up in front, because so I was like, man, I deserve to be because I have a music solo, like a singing solo. So we're all sitting up in these risers and we're all singing and all of a sudden our music teacher goes, all right, everyone stop. I remember, she goes like this, she goes, everyone stop. She's at the piano playing and she goes like this, she's like, stop. Somebody in this room isn't singing the right part. And I was like, what kind of idiot doesn't know how to sing Internet Christmas? It is the easy part. I was like, man, I'm so good. Everyone else sucks. And she's like going down the line. She's like, all right, everybody's singing. She's going like this. Everybody, one in a row. And then finally gets to me. I was like, man, people are about to be blown away. <laughs> so I get up there, and I start singing. And she goes, partner, stop. And she pulls out this, like, this, like, PVC pipe that's like shaped like a phone that you put up to your ear and then it goes up to your mouth and she's like singing to this and I start singing and she's like don't you hear how off you are <laughs> she was like and so what did she do she goes like this she goes okay during the play you still get the part but you need to mouth the words you're gonna have your schoolmate Joe Shikoski singing off to the back and you just mouth the words right and I was mad I was like what I was like I'm the best singer in this class. How dare she, right? And then all of a sudden, here comes the day of the play, and we're getting ready. We're out there, my part comes up, and I'm getting ready to sing. I see Joe Shikoski in the back, he's getting ready to sing. And I just sing, and I sing, and I sing, and our music teacher was so mad. And I promise you, I promise you, there's a point to this story, but just like in scripture, Right, just like in scripture, don't let anyone tell you what you can do and what you can't do. Especially when it comes to worshiping God. There are some of you who hold back worshiping and singing and raising your hands or even coming down to the altar as you feel uncomfortable and you don't think that you have a good voice. It ain't anybody else's business but yours and God's whether you worship the Lord or not. It, it doesn't matter whether or not you have a terrible voice or you're on the worship team. I encourage you, you need to sing to the Lord with all of your heart. You need to. You have to. Because whether or not you believe.
believe that you were created for youth ministry, kids ministry, whatever it is, in reality, every single person in this room was created to worship the Lord. Yep. It doesn't matter if you're good at drawing. It doesn't matter if you're an excellent driver. It doesn't matter if you're, matter if you're called to be um, a doctor or whatever. Those things are great, and I'm glad God has put that calling on your life. But you specifically are called and created to worship God, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, we, we and you can probably see all of these uh, sweatshirts we got on. In our, in our youth group, we do a theme every single year. Um, and our theme in 2021, the first time we ever did it, was NOB, AOB. Do you guys remember those? Like, you're walking around, you're like, what does no bow mean? Like, what the <laughs> heck is happening? Right, you see those sweaters. In 2022, our theme was what? Further, right? In order to go into the future, you have to go further in the future that God has set before you. That was 2022. And this year, you can already see um, this year's theme is nurture. It's nurture. How can we be intimate? How can we help? How can we take care of? How can we nurture the faith that God has for us? And I promise you, we're going to get back into that verse with Paul, but we'll do that in a little bit. But I just want to give you guys a message, like a title, if anybody's taking notes and you guys like message titles and things. The message title for today is New Song, A Nurture Message. And um, I think that when we nurture things, right, where you are at physically will affect where you're at spiritually. And a lot of it doesn't have to do so much with the state of our world. I know there's a lot of crazy things that are happening in our world, but I think a lot of it does have to do with lack of accountability and how much we're willing to compromise. And I think those three areas are the way that we speak, the way that we think, and the way that we think, sing. And those are the three questions I wanna ask you this morning um, and my first question, obviously, is what are you talking about? Turn to your neighbor and say, what are you talking about? Turn to your other neighbor and say, you try a breath mint next time. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, how many people like to talk? You're just a talker. Every time a report card would go home, my teachers would always tell my parents that I talk a lot and I get distracted a lot. And it's a blessing and a curse because I had a lot of friends, but I didn't do very well in school. Right, talking, right, and I and there's a couple of things that I, a couple of scriptures that I want to talk about. But how many people have ever heard the phrase "You shouldn't have said that"? You said that to somebody, and somebody pulls you inside and said, "You were a little too harsh." And I think we live in a day and age where we think that we can say whatever we want and say it harshly and boldly and slap a label on it and call it truth because we're saying what people are thinking. But listen to what these scriptures say, especially in Ephesians 4.29. It says, let no corrupt talking come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a time and a place for correction. There is a time and a place for accountability. And there is a time and a place for calling out. But if your first inclination isn't out of love, then we need to rethink why we're saying what we're saying. Let me also say this. We also live in a day and age where it's really easy to get offended. Amen. Cancel culture. Woke culture. But let me tell you this this morning. The minute that you say yes to Jesus, you lose the right to become a victim. Some of you weren't ready for that. Because your boss is talking down to you. Your kids are talking back. You feel like you have no voice and you feel like you're getting beat up on and you want to just share your feelings on Facebook. You want to text that person. But the minute that you say yes to Jesus, you lose the right to be a victim. The minute that you say yes to Jesus, you lose the right to be rude. The minute that you say yes to Jesus, you now have to watch what comes out of your mouth. 
Take a look at the scripture too. In James 1.26 it says, If anybody thinks he is religious, he does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religious religion is worthless. It means nothing. Right? Take a look in Proverbs 12.18. There is one whose heart rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Take a look at Psalm 34, 13. Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. I hear a lot of people, not even here, but just in general, the Capital C Church, talk about the church of the old days. They talk about how there was revival. And they talk about how every single person was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. I say this to your students and I'm going to say it to you now. Many of you want to speak in tongues, but a few of you want to tame your tongue. Hear that this morning. Mm -hmm. You're like, why aren't these students, why isn't this next generation taking religion more seriously? Your relationship with God, why aren't they coming to church? Why aren't they coming here? Why aren't they worshiping out loud, right? They're watching what you're doing. And if you can't tame your tongue, what makes you think they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be filled and start speaking in tongues and all these greatness starts coming out? They're watching what you're doing and how you're speaking. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, this message isn't directed to anyone in particular. So if you're sitting there and saying, like, he's talking to me. Take that as conviction of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's what your speech does. It does two things. The first one is it can help or it can hurt your character. The way you talk, the way you speak about other people can hurt or help your character. If I know that you're somebody who loves to capital G gossip, do you think I'm going to come to you with my problems and look for you for counsel? I'm going to be like, I'm going to stay clear of Jillian. No, I'm just kidding. Jillian's like, ah. I'm going to stay clear of Jordan and Logan because I just know they just run their mouth, blah, blah, blah. I'm not coming to you for prayer because I know if I open up my heart to you, you're going to tell somebody else. You have now just hurt your character and you're going to be known for somebody who gossips. That's the first thing. The second thing is it can hurt or help how others see God. You can sit there and say that you believe in the Lord and you worship and you serve on the kids team. <coughs> serve on the kids team. But you can be in the cafe. You can be on the worship team. You're like, I love the Lord. I'm going to put uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 in my Bible so everybody knows that he, I know the plans he has for me. Like all these things, you can put it out there publicly that you love the Lord. But if you start gossiping and tearing down somebody's character, you are now the representation of who Jesus Christ is. And you might be the only Jesus that people see. The only rep representation of the Holy Word. So it can help or hurt your character. It can help or hurt how people see Jesus. How many people want to be a part of a church that every single time we open our mouth to praise, blessing comes out. Anointing comes out. The Holy Spirit moves, right? I want to be a part of a church where every single pew is filled and we see revival happen every single day and we see people raising their hands to be filled with the Holy Spirit, giving their heart to Christ. Why? Because we're worshiping and they're saying, oh, I remember, I remember when Dennis Crucker invited me to church and I know he has high character and I know he speaks well of people and I know that he loves the Lord. It can help or hurt your character, and it can help or hurt how people see the church. Mm -hmm. The minute that you say yes to Jesus, you have given up the right to, like I said, capital G, gossip. You've given up the right to be the victim. Your boss is making you mad at, at, at work. They're making you angry. Oh, I'm going to go and I'm going to say all these nasty things about them to my friend. What if your boss wanted to come to church? Mm -hmm. And when all of a sudden they come strolling in thinking they're going to be welcome, you're like, oh, that person, they called them a rat the other day. They called them a jerk. You are now also destroying your character and their character. So it can help or hurt your character. It can help or hurt how people see God. What are you talking about? 
My second question is this, what are you thinking about? Um, it's so easy to get wrapped up in our thoughts. How many people sit there and lay awake at night trying to sleep but your mind won't shut off? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you see a little bump on your arm and your mind becomes like web and you're like, you're dead already. Right? And you get wrapped <laughs> up in all of these thoughts and all of these feelings and you cannot shut it off because you just keep thinking and thinking and thinking or you get wrapped up in impossible situations. Right? You have bad credit. You can't afford a home. You can't pay the bills on time. Feeling inadequate, not good enough, not skinny enough, not good looking enough, not qualified, a bad mother, a bad father, everyone hates you, you'll never be loved, and you get all of these thoughts in your head and you start to think that it must be true. We have all these thoughts and I guarantee that every single person in this room has struggled with a thought like that in some way, shape, or form. You're never going to get that promotion because you don't work hard enough. You're never going to be a good enough mom or dad. You're never going to be good enough to be used by the Lord. You're never going to be talented enough to make that team or play that music. You just suck. We've had those thoughts before. But what does scripture say? Take a look in 2 Corinthians 10.5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make an offense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And I think sometimes, reading those two scriptures, our biggest enemy is ourselves. Paul says it in scriptures that yes, there's going to be spiritual, but a lot of the things that you're going to be battling is your flesh. Sometimes your biggest enemy that's going to come at you is yourself that says, oh man, you said the wrong thing, you did the wrong thing. But listen to what it says right here. It says, we destroy any arguments that come against Christ. What is an argument against Christ? That you're not a child of God. That you're not righteous. That you're not holy enough. That you're not good enough. But we are the righteousness of Christ. So you need to be prepared, always having a defense for the hope that is in you. So when you get your stinking thinking and you're sitting in your house and you're alone and you say you're not good enough, how are you going to combat that? You need to know what the Bible says. Because if you don't know what scripture says, you're going to start looking to the world and say, oh, we all have our own truths. Let me just say this about truth. Truth does not compromise. And let me also say this, truth does not contradict. You can't have partial truth. You can't have half truth. It's all or nothing. There's only true and false in this world. And how many people want the truth? Because yeah. truth has a name and its name is Jesus Christ. So all of a sudden you get in your thoughts and you start to think that way. I love the second part of 2 Corinthians 10.5 because it says take every captive, every thought captive, every single thought that comes in your mind. Whether you think it, whether the enemy plants it in your head, no matter what it is, you need to take it captive and make it obey Christ and say, you know what? I think that I'm not good enough. I think that I suck. I think all these things, but this is what Jesus says in the Bible. This is what the Word says. You can think all day long, but you need to take those thoughts captive. Amen. Look in Colossians 3, 2 through 4. And when you know his promises and you know his word, these are the verses that you'll get. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden away with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. How many people want to appear with Christ in glory? Yeah. You get those verses when you know the word and you're like, but it's the pastor's job to teach us. It's the pastor's job to teach our kids. It's the pastor's job to relay scripture. And some of that is true. But I need a church and I need generations in this room to step up and say, I'm going to take control of my own faith. Yeah. I'm not going to ride on the coattails of Pastor Scott Nanny. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make sure that the only time that my kids get to hear about Jesus is with Pastor Parker. 
The only time that I'm going to be in a small group is on anchor group nights. I need some people to step up and step out and say, this is my faith. How do I nurture it? And when you start to think all of these things, you need to switch up your thinking. And just like I said, you need to start asking, what does the Bible say? The Bible says you are more than a conqueror. He says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I called you by name. He is faithful to complete what he started. He knows the plans he has for you. He works things out for my own good. He will always lead us to victory. He is the one who is and was and is to come. He is your past, present, and future. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the Alpha Omega. He is our victory. You don't get that from reading posts on Twitter all day long. You don't get that from watching Fox News every single night. The only time that you get that is in this word. This is truth. And some of you are like, Pastor Parker, I'm so tired from work and I'm so busy. I did not get enough time to read the Bible. I think that is the lousiest excuse I've ever heard in my life. That you didn't have time to worship the creator of the universe. How? Because if you look, if I ask everybody to pull out their phone and look at the screen time, I'll tell you where you have time. The creator of the universe who spoke existence from just saying, let there be light. He spoke it. He knows everything. He's everywhere. And he's in this room. He's when you drive home in your car. He's with you at work, and you're telling me you don't have time to spend with the Creator. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein. You belong to the Lord. You have time for the Creator of the universe. And if that means sacrificing some TV time, do it. If that means waking up a little bit earlier than usual, do it. If that means losing some sleep and going to bed a little bit later, do it. Because when you spend time with God, you talk to God. And when you talk to God, you get closer to God. And when you get closer to God, you start to talk about him more and more in your day. God bless you, brother. I'm praying for you. How can I pray with you? And I guarantee that routine can get into your system even if it's only five minutes a day. Even if it's only one minute a day. Even if you just pull out your phone and go on to the Bible app and just read the verse of the day, it's better than nothing. Remember when Pastor Scott said 50% is better than no percent? <laughs> Increase is coming, y'all. <laughs> Increase is coming. So what are you thinking about? What are you talking about? And my last, ver and my last question for you is this. What are you singing about? What are you singing about? I love music, and like I said, that I love to sing. But I love, like, jazz and punk rock and early 2000s bands. I got a whole playlist that I just listen when I drive. How many people can't drive until you get your playlist on? And you're scrolling your phone, and you're like, hold on, one second, I'm going to drive in a second. You're trying to put this playlist on. Driving. How many people listen to music when you're in the shower? How many people listen to music when you're at the gym? How many people have a, word, or a playlist when you're sad? And you're like, this is my playlist when I'm sad and it's filled with sad songs. This is the playlist that I play when I'm angry. This is the place when I do this or that. And I think sometimes, even as Christians, we like to justify what we watch and what we listen to. Oh, Pastor Parker, I only listen to, how many times have I heard this from a student? Whether it's on my old church or this church, how many times have I ever heard, I just listen to it for the beat. I like the beat, Pastor Parker. Or you get like out in bands and you get all these like music nerds and you're like, the instrumentation of the song is insane, Pastor Parker. <laughs> right? And you get all of these excuses. Or how many people love TV shows and movies? I love TV shows and movies. How many people have ever said, saw The Office? Right? I love The Office. And how many people quote The Office? How many quote all of these things? And you watch these medias and you try to justify why you're watching or listening to these things. But you don't think that the devil can't use that to distract you? For years and years, I would struggle with depression and I would lock myself in my room and I would play this playlist of all these terrible songs. 
And my first inclination, whenever I would feel anxious, whenever I would feel a little sad, I'd go to this playlist and I'd pop it in my ears. Remember when I said if your first inclination isn't Jesus, then we need to rethink things? I'm a professional procrastinator, even writing this message. I didn't finish it till yesterday. And how many people know that when you're a procrastinator, you start to do random things that you've never done? And I'm like sitting in the corner of like this of my kitchen being like, oh, this hasn't been scrubbed in a while. Like moving furniture and vacuuming. I was like, this can be wiped out. I'm like in like my my bathroom like has this ledge in the in the shower, I'm like, oh, I don't think I've ever scrubbed this before. Ah, and I'm doing all of these things, and I'm trying to justify while I'm being anxious, and I'm trying to ignore it. And then all of a sudden, like, I texted a lot of my friends that I know will keep me accountable. And I texted them, I said, hey, I haven't finished my message yet. Will you just text me and check up on me and make sure that I'm doing this? And I'm sitting there, I, like, turn the TV on. I'm, like, eating popcorn. And my friend texted me, he's like, how's your message going? <laughs> and you try to justify these things and my first thought in my head wasn't I'm feeling anxious and I need to bring this to the Lord and the Holy Spirit really convicted me I'm like scrubbing a plate that I like washed three times like there's still a speck on it and God's like what are you doing right now <laughs> you're obviously feeling this emotion and you're not bringing this to me you're not handing it over to me and I'm like man you're right, Lord, and this is going to sound weird, but he was like, draw the shades, put a candle on, shut your door, and just worship. And I'm not going to tell you what he said to me, because that is between me and the Lord. But how many times have you been given the opportunity to spend time with the Lord and just praise him, and you ignored it? Even right here, right now in this room, every Sunday at 10.30... You have the opportunity to come in here, listen to the word, and sing praises to them. But some of us want to just watch football on a Sunday. There are some of us that say, oh, I need to go shopping and return this to the store. I can't go to church today. You are given the opportunity every single week to praise him, to worship him. To this place, the Holy Spirit is here because it says where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am among them. That's truth. And there's probably, what, 75, 80 people in this room? The Holy Spirit's here, y'all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we have the opportunity. We just moved youth to Thursday nights, if you didn't know. And how many times I'll text a student and say, hey, you coming tonight? I'm like, well, oh, man, baseball practice, wait me out, Pastor Parker. Or, oh, man, I got to study. Like, it used to be on Sundays. And it was like, I didn't do my homework. I said, like, you had all weekend to do your homework, and you're telling me Sunday night at 6 o'clock, right? And we give you these opportunities to worship and praise the Lord, and we miss out on those moments. And further than that, the Lord gives you an opportunity by yourself in your daily routine to worship Him, and you miss out on that. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want you to walk away sad or feeling uncomfortable because how many people know there's grace for you? And there's forgiveness, and God is righteous, and he says, I love you, you are forgiven. But what would happen if we as a church, unforcibly, just started worshiping God? Here in the presence of the Lord, in, the, in God's house, and also at our homes. What would happen if every single person in this room started talking so well about each other and started preaching the gospel and telling people, their classmates, their friends, that you are loved, you have a purpose, and there is a God who loves you so much? What would happen as we as a church walked out of here and set our minds on things above and thought about the Holy Spirit? We thought about how good he is, how mighty he is, how strong he is. What would happen if us as a church started doing those three things on our own and also corporately together? We talk about wanting revival. Watch as revival breaks out as we as a church do these three things together. Watch what happens when that family member that has walked away from you for so long, your friend that has walked away from the church, turns around and comes back. 
Watch what happens when that sick family member that you've been praying for healing and healing and healing. Watch what happens when that person gets healed because you start switching up your thinking, the way you talk, and the way you sing. Revival's coming, y'all. And I'm not, and I am not like a conspiracy theorist that's like, oh, the end times are tomorrow, right? The revelation is coming, whether we want it or not. Yeah. Right? It is coming. But honestly, the capital C church, the Church of America, I don't know if we're ready for the persecution that's headed our way. Because there are some of us who will destroy your own character and other people's character for someone cut you off in traffic. There are some people in this room that will stop being a Christian for 30 seconds because you stub your toe really hard. And listen, I say that as a joke, but in all seriousness, the things that's happening in our world with gender reassignment and racial reconciliation and political climate, yes, that hurts your heart. But our first thought shouldn't be the end times are coming, leave those people. Our first inclination, our first thought should be, let me sing songs of praise to God over you. Amen. Let me tell you about who Jesus Christ is. Let me tell you that you have a future and you have a purpose and you are loved and you are anointed and you are called and you are a child of God. Amen. There's a lot of broken hurt. People, and here's a statistic really quick, and I'm sure I've said this before, but in St. Clair Shores alone, there's about 20 churches, whether they're Pentecostal, whether they're Baptist, whether they're Lutheran, Catholic, it doesn't matter. There's, there's 20 churches in St. Clair Shores. And statistically speaking, if every single church looked like this where we could hold a thousand people, how many people can you have on a Sunday morning? 20,000. 20, <coughs> Some people aren't good at math. Uh, 20,000 people on a Sunday morning. That's if you have one service at one church. There are over 100,000 people in St. Clair Shores. There's four area codes for St. Clair Shores alone, y'all. There's work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. There's work that needs to be done, and we need a church that's ready to roll up our sleeves and say, you know what? I'm going to talk about God, I'm going to think about God, and I'm going to sing about God. Amen. I said it earlier in the message, but let me reiterate something. And I told this to our students before, too. But where you are at physically will affect where you're at spiritually. Where you're at physically will affect where you're at spiritually. If you're in your dark room all day long with no sunshine, no people, no, no community, you're going to feel isolated. If you work every single day nonstop and you don't take a break, you're going to be burned out. If you don't come to anchor groups or you don't come and serve or you don't come and worship in the morning, you're going to feel alone. Where you're at physically will affect where you're at spiritually. What you're doing physically will affect where you're at spiritually. If we're in a worship service and you feel so uncomfortable because everybody's raising their hands like this and singing, and you're just in the back like this, like in the corner, you're like, I'm not going to engage. I guarantee that your physical posture is also imitating your heart posture. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that you have to be down here like Chris May. How many people love worshiping with Chris May? Because he claps his hands, he shouts and praises the Lord. That's how he worships, and that's amazing. And you don't have to do that if you don't want to. That might not be how you worship the Lord. But you need to be able to position yourself that imitates the position of your heart. How you feel about God. How you worship about God, about God. And I want to just say this going back to what you're singing about. I look back in the story of Paul, and I'm going to go back all the way up here. But I just love this. I mean, how I, many of you, many of you will never find yourself in a position where you're in prison. Many of you will never find yourself in a position where people are kicking and beating you to death with rocks. That's what hap is happening in the story of Paul and Silas. All they did was cast out a demon, which they were called to do by the power of the Holy Ghost. 
and they were thrown in front of the government and they start kicking the crap out of them, ripping off their garments and threw them into prison. You may never find yourself in that position. And that's okay. But some of you are finding yourself in a position where you're very depressed. And you're very alone. And you're very isolated. And you're dealing with trauma. Some of you are recovering from an abusive situation. Some of you are recovering from divorce. Some of you are recovering from um, a terrible job where you just got drained. Some of you are dealing with all of these things and you're in this situation. But can we take a page out of Saul and Paul and Silas's book and just sing praises to God? They're sitting here locked in this prison and who knows what happens. Back in, back in, this, back in this era, if you were thrown in prison nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, it would end in your death. You would be killed. You would be martyred. Instead of sitting there thinking, oh man, they're coming for us. Oh man, what are we going to do? Oh man, I don't know if I'm strong enough to endure this. Let's start talking about the one who is strong enough to endure this. Let's start singing the praises of the God who is and was and is to come. Let's start talking about the God who created you who knitted you in your mother's womb. I love in Psalms when it says that he, he knits you in his secret place. Have you ever like saw a little kid before? When you give them something that they love so much, what do they do? They hold on to it, they grasp it, right? And sometimes they'll hide it from you. They're like, hey, what do you got in your hand right there? And they're like running, they're like, like this. When people over work with little kids, they just run away from you. You have this thing, you're like, no, it's mine, it's mine. You're like, you can't have this, it's mine. <coughs> That's what God does to you. It says he knits you, he sews you in his, in his secret place, and he holds you so close to his heart, and he says, you're mine. You're mine. And for some reason, we still find it hard, when we even come to that realization, we still find it hard to sing worship to him. We still say it's too hard to sacrifice time for him. And he's holding you so close to his heart. You can hear his heartbeat. You can hear when he's singing over you. He says, you are mine. Take a look at Psalms 111. And I'm going to read the whole psalm. But man, I love this psalm so much. It's, 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 it's just so good. It says, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Father with all my whole heart in the company of the upright. In the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his works, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with righteousness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. They fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the person who, who wrote this, it's not named. But a majority of the Psalms was written by a guy named David. And David was the true king of Israel. The Holy Spirit came upon him and left Saul because Saul was wicked and evil and he was a liar. And he, he disobeyed the Lord. And Saul didn't want to give up that kingship. He said, no, this is mine. I'm the king. And when he found out that David was supposed to be the king, he chased him down and he tried to kill him multiple times. David had his whole family turn their, turn their backs on him. David had his whole nation trying to kill him. 
David had no home, no place to rest his head, so he slept in caves and in fields, and he never washed or bathed, and he didn't have a place to do laundry. His shoes, his brand new shoes were getting all muddy. It was gross because he didn't have anything to eat, so he had to go to different temples of the Lord and ask for food, praying that they weren't going to kill him or outcast him. And listen to the majesty of his words. How poetic is he singing? The Lord is marvelous and his works endure forever. He is faithful. When was the last time in your situation that you started to remember how majestic the Lord is? You sat there and you started to think how big and great our God is. When was the last time you just started singing songs of praise because you were filled with joy? When was the last time? So my question still stands, what are you singing about? Are you listening to these songs that talk about drugs and sex and womanizing because you like the beat? Or are you singing songs of praise because you know how good he is and how victorious he is? Amen. There's a song in worship. You guys can start heading up. But there's the song that I always sing whenever I get stressed out, whenever I'm angry, whenever I'm mad, or whenever I'm happy. And I know a lot of you know this song, and I'm going to sing it, and you're like, oh, no. We need to get out of here quick. Finish up. I'm going to sing the song, and if you know the song, if you know the song, I want you to sing it with me. But every time I get in this moment where I start to feel stressed and I start to feel the world come around me, I always turn to the song and it goes, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship. And I start to tear up because I remember all the times that God has come through for me. And I remember all the prayers that he answered. And I remember all those times when I'm sitting there thinking about one of your students or one of your kids. And I'm weeping in my room and the Holy Spirit just comes and he comforts me. I remember all those times that I sang and I prayed and I asked God for my sister. And I remember how many times that he just came through for me. And that song, I love that song because there's no expectation. There's no, Lord, I need promotion when you bring it to me. Instead, it's just, Lord, you are good. And I worship you. When was the last time you just worshiped him? And there are some of you that have such great pain, and I'm not saying those things don't matter, but if you're constantly thinking about the trial that's in front of you, you're never going to look up and see the God who's bigger than all of it. There is a God who sent his son to die on the cross for you and give you forgiveness for every dumb thing you've ever done. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you did or what you were doing before hours before coming in here. He says he loves you and he forgives you. There is a God who sent his son to be nailed to the cross, 
died for your sins, but he rose again, defeating death, and one day he's coming back for his bride. Amen. And I think as a church, not, like I said, not just this church, Capital C Church, we do a bad job at not only just singing in our worries, but we do a bad job at singing over generations to come. There's a whole world out there that needs the love of a father. There's a whole world out there that needs forgiveness. And we're so comfortable within these four walls. We say, we'll wake up for church. We're going to go at 1030. We're going to worship. And then we're going to go home and watch the lines. And then Monday comes. Then Tuesday comes. Then Wednesday comes. Then Thursday comes. And Friday and Saturday. And by then we had already forgotten what God spoke to us on Sunday morning. And then we do it again. I heard this saying, and they turned it into a song. It's one of my pastors that I love so much. But he says, the devil's not afraid of a Sunday faith. But the devil is afraid of the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And watch what happens when you start to sing Jesus over the lost. Watch what happens when you start to sing Jesus over your families. Watch what happens when you start to sing Jesus over your finances. Watch what happens when you start to sing Jesus over every situation that brings you grief. And every good situation. So we're going to go, go into the song. And then I'm going to come up and end. But the song is very dear to my heart. And some of you have never heard the song. But I remember when I was in youth group. How many people remember those days when you were in youth group? Right? And you remember your pastor. You, you don't really remember the messages, but you remember the people. You remember youth convention and the kids' convention and all those things. And there was this moment where my, pat, where my youth pastor comes up and he starts preaching about how we need an anthem to our, to our faith. We need an anthem for our generation. And I just remember that there were... So, like, I, I can't remember how many people were in our youth group, but the whole youth group just comes down to the altar and they start flooding the altar and they're singing and they're clearing. They're saying, I will go, I'll show the power of your love. Further than you singing over the situations, when was the last time you told God that you were going to go? When were you... When was the last time that you said, God, I know the calling you have on my life. I know that you have commissioned us, so I'm going to go. Because if we sit here on a Sunday morning and we think people are going to come to us, we're missing the whole message of the gospel. We say the Great Commission every single Sunday. Go and make disciples, right? But for some reason, there's something in our brain that's stopping us, something in our heart that's stopping us to where we're not going. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to call you up and we're going to sing this song. But I don't want you to come up here at this altar if you're just doing it because everyone else is doing it. I want you to come up to this altar because you are ready to go and show the power of Jesus Christ. Because he has given you the authority to do it already. And there might be some spiritual battles. You might have to miss out on some family time. You might have to sacrifice some things that you love so much. But in the grand scheme of things, Pastor Scott says it every single week. I want to make heaven crowded. I want my eternal life to be with my family and friends singing praises to them. That's what I want. And if that's what you want, I want you to stand up and come to this altar right now. Don't worry about who's standing up and who's coming down. But if you are somebody who wants to make sure that your friends and your family... Know who Jesus Christ is. I want you to come down to this altar and sing this song with us.